Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. All right, Revelation chapter 12. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She, she was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains, in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So as I thought about Genesis 3.15 and the promise of a son who would crush the head of the serpent, and I, as I thought about uh, the this, this sermon text this morning, Revelation 12, with the, the dragon who is the serpent. And I thought about how these, one at the very beginning of the story, one at the very end of the story, and how they function in the, in the, the entire canon, the broader canon of Scripture, I was reminded of uh, Sam Mendez's use, uh, Sam Mendez is a director, Sam Mendez's use of symmetry in his, I think, brilliant World War I movie 1917. Uh, 1917 has an inclusio, an intentional set of bookends, one at the beginning, one at the end, that informs how the rest of the movie is to be interpreted. And having watched the film a few times, I felt like Mendez was intentionally trying to relay certain ideas on themes through a, a mirroring effect. Um, in the opening, in both the opening and the closing scenes. So, in terms of sermon research, I decided that I was going to re-watch it this week to make sure I'm not telling you a lie. And uh, I watched it, watched it with my oldest son, and I did confirm it. 1917 begins and ends with a British soldier uh, resting against a tree in April 1917 in France. 
He's resting against a tree in the midst of a beautiful field of grass and flowers. In 1917, if you watch the movie closely, wherever there are trees, you see life and rest. But wherever trees have been cut down or burned, you see death and destruction. And I think it's intentional that trees are associated with life and with rest, home and family. The movie starts with a man, Schofield, Lance Corporal Schofield, with his eyes closed, resting under a tree near another soldier, Blake. These men are pulled out of rest. They're given a mission to deliver a life-saving message to another division miles away. And they make their way through the battlefield of death and decay. All the trees have been burnt or cut down. A lone, leafless tree stands in the background as the two men barely make it out, out alive of a German bunker. And one man then says to the other, keep your eyes on the trees. And when they enter a grove of trees, it's like night and day. Having nearly just died, being angry with one another about the mission, once they walk into this grove of trees, the men begin to relax, laughing as they they tell stories of home. Cherry blossoms in the film communicate life and the new birth at different points in the film. And after one man crawls over a number of fallen soldiers in order to enter a wooded area, he's immediately greeted by a voice singing a hymn. And this mesmerizing hymn speaks of a soldier going home, seeing family, and entering God's rest in the promised land. And the film then ends with a mirror of the opening. Schofield sits under a tree near a soldier named Blake, with his eyes closed in rest and his thoughts on family and home. And the themes of rest and home and family, the beauty of creation, the horrors of war, are all sandwiched in between these mirroring scenes. The cinematography and storytelling are masterful and help to communicate visually the themes of this compelling story. And that's, that's what good storytellers do. And God is the greatest storyteller. And all of his stories are true. And he's written a story. And he's given it to us in Scripture. And the beginning and the end of the Bible are a set of bookends. A canonical inclusio, if you want to be academic about it. That informs how we're to read the Scriptures. There's clear symmetry and mirroring between Genesis and Revelation. One has a garden and another has a perfect garden. One is creation, the other is new creation. In Genesis, you see rest in God's presence. In Revelation, you see eternal rest in God's permanent presence. In Genesis, you see a tree that leads to cursing. In Revelation, you see a tree that leads to healing. In Genesis, you see a man defeated by a serpent. In Revelation, you see a serpent defeated by a man. In Genesis, you see the fall. In Revelation, you see redemption. Our text this morning is a part of the Bible's bookends helping us to understand God's story of our redemption. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Genesis 3.15 promise. The Son has come who will crush the head of the serpent. In Revelation 12, we see a 60,000 foot view of how God's promised Son has been revealed in redemptive history. And how His incarnation has undone the curse brought about by sin and Satan. Now, the genre of the book of Revelation is apocalyptic, which means that you don't read and interpret Revelation the same way that you read historical narrative or a New Testament epistle. Reading Revelation, like it's 1 Corinthians, will lead you to all kinds of misunderstanding and misinterpretation. Okay, you'll see locusts as Apache helicopters. Apocalyptic literature is intentionally and heavily symbolic. It involves, at least in Scripture, a variety of prophetic pronouncements that are encased in metaphor and symbols that were common during the Old Testament prophets and the intertestamental period between the close of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament. Revelation leans heavily on promise fulfillment in biblical topology. Topology. 
Okay, I've said these words to y'all before, and I'm going to keep saying them. Let it wash over you. <clears throat> it leans heavily on these features, which are just features of prophecy. Revelation as prophecy is both looking back and looking forward. Now, here's a ten-cent word, Robin. Recapitulation, or the idea of a person or an event or a theme being repeated over and over and over and over again is very common in apocalyptic literature, and it's common in Revelation. Like the Old Testament prophets before him, John likes to tell his readers one idea in six different ways. All right, so as my Old Testament professor in, uh, told me, think about this as a surround sound system communicating the same message in a variety of ways from a variety of perspectives. So the book of Revelation leans heavily upon the Old Testament, particularly Isaiah and Daniel. <clears throat> And mis misinterpretation of the book of Revelation often occurs. <laughs> Let me just be clear. It often occurs. Maybe your only exposure to Revelation is the Left Behind series. Okay? While it's an entertaining book series, you should not read it for theology. Misinterpretation of the book of Revelation often occurs because Christians don't read Revelation according to its genre, apocalyptic literature. And they don't properly understand the nature and function of biblical prophecy. All right, so that being said, there, we've got to be humble. We've got to be open to correction as we venture into Revelation 12. There's a lot of debate over lots of ideas in this book. We're only spending one week in it. The more, while I was in it this week studying, I was like, man, this would be really fun to go through in a sermon series. But I've got to first finish 1 Corinthians. So, this morning, I have one overarching main idea, all right? But the passage is broken down, in my mind, into three separate sections, okay? So, one big idea, three different but interrelated themes. So, here's the big idea. King Jesus has silenced the accuser and secured his people by his blood. King Jesus has silenced the accuser and secured his people by his blood. I'm going to say that, that idea in lots of different ways, trying to replicate the Hebrew prophets, but I'm not going to say that line again, so I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> King Jesus has silenced the accuser and secured his people by his blood. All right, so here, here are the three different sections, three different themes. <clears throat> In verses 1 to 6, the sun now reigns. The sun now reigns. In verses 7 to 12, the serpent is silenced. The serpent is silenced. In verses 13 to 17, the Savior secures us. The Savior secures us. All right, the sun now reigns. Let's look at the verse six, six verses. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out on birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days." All right, Revelation 12 begins not by looking forward, but by looking backward. This first section of Revelation 12 gives us a very brief snapshot of the history of God's Old Testament saints as they wait for the Messiah while enduring the attacks of Satan. 
In verses 1 to 2, we see a pregnant woman ready to give birth. Now, we might be tempted to believe it's Mary, but I don't think that's right because of the description in verse 1 of the woman herself. A woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. If you'll remember, the grandson of Abraham was Jacob, renamed Israel by God. Israel had 12 sons who later became the 12 tribes of Israel. And if you think back to Genesis 37, where Joseph has a couple of dreams that he unwisely tells the rest of his family, <clears throat> Joseph has a dream where the sun, his father, the moon, his mother, and 11 stars, his 11 brothers, are all bowing down to him. Now that dream comes true in Egypt. In Genesis 37, the sun, moon, and stars were a divinely given picture of the family of Israel. And this same imagery of Israel and the Old Testament community of saints is present here in Revelation 12. So the woman, I believe, is intended to communicate the community of saints. Specifically in these first six verses, we see that it's Old Testament Israel. And the fact that she's coming from heaven and wearing a crown should remind you of the fact that God made Old Testament Israel a royal priesthood. If we understand this woman to be a symbol of God's Old Testament saints Israel, then the birth pangs she endures in verse 2 are the pains of God's Old Testament people throughout the Old Testament longing for the promised Messiah. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years they waited, dealing with sin and oppression and enemies of God attacking them and dominating them. The son to come had been promised to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, to Israel, to David. The prophets kept reminding the people over Israel over the course of hundreds of years, years which included Gentile domination, Exile, slavery, and eventual return to the promised land, but under Gentile oppressors, that the Messiah was coming soon, and they needed to keep repenting. The promised son would soon arrive to save his people and sit upon the throne of David as the promised priest king. That's throughout the prophets. In verse 3, we see that much of the pain that God's Old Testament saints are having to endure as a result of the works of the serpent who first appeared in Genesis 3. Look at, look at verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. So we need to understand at least four things here, just briefly. First, the serpent or dragon is appearing in heaven. All right, that's important. We'll touch on that in a few minutes. Secondly, the dragon is not new. He's not new to the story. Genesis 3 introduces a serpent. The Old Testament speaks frequently about Leviathan or Rahab, an Old Testament beast that often symbolized Egypt or other worldly kingdoms that were the enemies of Israel. For example, Isaiah 27.1. In that day, the Lord with his hard and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Isaiah 30, verse 7. Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab, who sits still. Isaiah 51, 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Rahab, Leviathan, dragon, serpent, regardless of how you're talking about it in the Old Testament, it's referring to the same being. This red dragon or serpent in Revelation 12 should be understood as Satan. But John is showing us something. He's showing us cosmic realities. What do I mean? Satan himself. Satan himself is behind all the worldly powers who oppress and seek to harm God's people. 
In the Old Testament, Egypt often served as the symbol of all of Israel's enemies because of the Egyptian slavery that Israel endured and the oppression they endured in the Exodus narrative. John is pulling back the curtain, okay, showing us spiritual realities behind the physical realities that we see with our eyes. John wants to show us that Satan is the power behind the enemies of God. Whether it's Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or Persia or Greece or Rome or China or the United States or whomever, Satan is behind the powers that oppress God's people. And the fact that the dragon is red... I think is likely tied to the shedding of blood of the saints. The great prostitute Babylon in Revelation 17, again, a a symbol meant to encapsulate Rome and all the enemies of God. In Revelation 17, rides a scarlet beast. She gets drunk by drinking the blood of the saints. It's likely, likely that this red dragon is intended to communicate a similar idea. This dragon sheds the blood of the saints. And he has since the beginning. All right, third. The dragon has numerous heads, horns, and diadems. What in the world? All right. These are intended to communicate worldly rule and power. Okay, we're, this is one week in Revelation 12, so we're going to blast through this. In Daniel 7... The fourth beast in Daniel's vision has ten horns on its head, symbolizing ten rulers. In Revelation 5, the Lamb of God is said to have horns on his head, symbolizing his authority and rule. The dragon in Revelation 12 is falsely laying claim to the sovereign rule of God's promised king. He has power, but he wants ruling power. He's grasping at God's power. And in the chapters to come, you're going to see another imitation of God, an unholy trinity of the dragon and the the beast and the false prophet. Satan is imitating God. Fourth, in verse 4, we see the red dragon swipe a third of the stars from heaven to earth. Now, these stars could refer to angels, but this seems unlikely in context. In Daniel 8.10, Daniel uses symbolism to talk about how the Greek ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, oppressed Israel in the years leading up to the birth of Christ. Antiochus Epiphanes oppressed Israel by saying that Antiochus threw down stars from heaven and trampled upon them. And he's talking about Israel. Antiochus Epiphanes threw down people and trampled on the nation of Israel, slaughtered a pig on the altar in the temple. And in Daniel, these, the stars that Antiochus Epiphanes throws down is the people of Israel. John is heavily reliant upon the prophet Daniel for a lot of his imagery. So again... John's vision, up to this point, is highlighting the fact that the dragon oppresses God's people. He tramples upon them. He kills them. He casts down a third of them. And he will use his earthly powers in order to destroy the promised son of Israel that they have been groaning for expectantly. And by the end of verse 4, the dragon's ready to devour the promised son of Israel But when Israel gives birth, God protects this son. Why? Because he promised this son. Dragon's ready to devour the son. Think about King Herod. Ordering the death of all the young children in Bethlehem. Who do you think was ultimately behind that wicked command? The dragon. What did God do before Herod could accomplish that task? God brought Jesus, Mary, and Joseph out of Bethlehem, hid them in Egypt so that Herod would not succeed. 
God's mission to save His people, to send His Son to accomplish our redemption, and to have His Son rule as the King of kings and Lord of lords could not be thwarted. Israel gives birth to a son who is to do what? John pulls in Psalm 2 language here. This son, he is the Davidic son, the son who will rule with righteousness and justice and with an iron scepter, the son to whom all nations and rulers and kings must submit, the son under whose feet God will subject all of his enemies. That is the son. Revelation 12, 5 <laughs> likely gives us the shortest gospel presentation in all of Scripture. And he uses half of the verse to describe the actions of the dragon. The promised son and Davidic king was born of Israel and then ascended to heaven to rule as the king. How many times have you heard somebody share the gospel with you and say, Jesus was born and now he's ascended? What is accomplished by the incarnation of the Son that many of you just celebrated? What is accomplished by the incarnation of the Son and His eventual ascent to God's right hand as King? Look at verse 6. God saves His saints, the woman, takes us out of the dragon's oppression, and leads us into the safety of the wilderness. In other words, think about this in terms of Exodus. Through the birth of this promised son and his ascension to God's right hand, God saves his people through a new exodus. Freeing us from the oppression of God's enemy, Satan. Now, the wilderness was a place free of Egyptian slavery, but it was not a safe place for Israel. The scriptures often use the wilderness to speak about a place where evil is located or where dangers exist for God's people. God saves us from the oppression of the devil through the work of His promised Son, King Jesus, but our deliverance is into a temporary place. We are saved, but we still live in a dangerous place. This dangerous place is temporary, but it's still a wilderness. So most importantly, beloved, we are safe because of the perfect work of our King Jesus. He has freed us permanently from the oppression and tyranny of Satan and his worldly powers, even if we still have to temporarily live in a dangerous place. So as a Christian, you have been delivered from the power of Satan but you are constantly surrounded by the danger of this present wilderness. You are not living in your forever home. You are not yet home. You are a stranger, an alien in this world. You have been saved out from under the oppression of the devil, but you're walking through this wilderness of a world as you make your way to the promised land, the new creation, where King Jesus will reign in His fullness forever. So don't get distracted here. Okay, that's the biggest issue with American Christians. It's not that we're going to get torn, torn apart by wild beasts, like some maybe Christians in Afghanistan, but we'll get distracted and want to stay here. Don't get comfortable. John's powerful imagery here is intended to clearly show you the cosmic realities that are taking place in this present world. Everything is purposeful. And everything has a spiritual aspect behind it. King Jesus is reigning and ruling at God's right hand, but you're in the wilderness. Okay, It's a very comfortable wilderness for us, which is quite dangerous. You're on your way home after being freed from your exile. Don't get distracted by the cares and concerns of this sinful world. This world is a wrath-inducing world. Don't get distracted like the Israelites 
by the idolatry, the sexual immorality, the values of this present world, it's not your ultimate home. Okay, I can just say that for 50 minutes. It is not your ultimate home. Don't live like it. Man, that's a good, that's a good message right after many of us gave our kids probably lots of presents. It's not your ultimate home. This isn't the end. King Jesus has ascended, and while He's ruling from heaven, He's preparing for you a place Amen. to live forever. And it's not here. No. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on the coming new creation as you labor through the difficulties of this present wilderness. No circumstances, no unbelief, no job, no health issues, no enemies, no difficulties, nothing will keep you from your new creation home because Christ has secured it. But you must remain vigilant to strive by God's power to keep heading to that promised land. We must do it together. We keep heading to the promised land because the king's on the throne. He's in charge. Nothing can thwart God's king. But how do, we, how do we strive? How do we keep striving without losing heart in the midst of a very difficult wilderness, in the midst of the flaming darts and accusations from the enemy, Satan? How do we keep striving without losing heart when we see our sin? And the second, second theme is the serpent is silence. Look at verses 7 to 12. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short." In Genesis 3, uh, the serpent lied, and all humanity died. And then Satan began the work of constantly accusing God's people of sin before God's heavenly throne. Satan wasn't in heaven because he loved God. He's not there because he enjoyed God's company. He's there to constantly accuse God's people of their sin. But look at verses 7 to 9. This picture here of Michael and the angels of heaven fighting Satan, it's, it's not intended by John to get you guessing or speculating on, on maybe when or where God threw Satan out of heaven or, or how Satan could be in heaven while he was a sinner. The dragon has been tossed out, which means something has fundamentally changed regarding the accusations of Satan against God's people. The primary point here is that the voice of Satan, the voice of the accuser, no longer has God's ears. It is no longer in heaven at God's throne, that voice of the accuser. Why? Because the promised Son was born and has ascended to the right hand of God as the promised eternal King. Satan has lost his squatter's rights in heaven. He's been given the boot. Look at the announcement of salvation in verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Because of the person and work of this promised Son, King Jesus, Satan no longer has any platform or standing to constantly accuse and condemn God's people of sin. Verse 
Do you understand the magnitude of this mighty act of God? Satan has historically been in God's ears at the throne, accusing the saints, brothers and sisters, from Old Testament to New Testament, night and day before our perfectly just God. Do you see the problem? The problem is that God is perfectly just. What's the problem with Satan accusing us? Because many of his accusations against God's people were justified because of our sin. Apart from Christ, the worst part about many of Satan's accusations of my sin is that they're true. How can I be happy that Michael and his angels have tossed Satan from heaven when many of Satan's accusations of my sin are true? How can I rejoice in verse 10 salvation if the basis of Satan's accusations, my sin, is still staring me in the face? See our hope in verse 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. In Christ I have conquered the accusations of the dragon, how? By the blood of the Lamb. Satan has been defeated and silenced not by my excellent works, not by my or morally upstanding life, not by how great a husband or father or friend or pastor I am, not by how often I read my Bible, not by the strength of my faith, not by how strongly I feel that God loves me, nor by how near I sense God's presence to me. Satan has been defeated in silence because Christ died and his blood covers me. The accusations against you from the enemy are made ineffectual. How? Because of the blood of the Lamb. Satan has no audience with our God in accusing us of our sin and failures. Why? God has executed justice against our sin, beloved, by pouring out His just wrath on His willing Son so that the church would stand before God as His justified people in Christ. Accusations and condemnation for sin are useless against Christ's justified people. King Jesus put death to death, and he alone reigns supreme. Satan's accusations against you may sound persuasive in your ear, but the blood of the Lamb speaks a better word to our God. Our Heavenly Father listens to the Lamb, not the liar. And the Lamb of God, King Jesus, says of us, they're mine. They're mine. I've ransomed them by my blood and made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign with me. It's here in verse 11 that we see, again, the source of power that Satan has over the world. It's sin. Sin is what gives Satan power. Sin is what brings death. Sin is what brings God's just wrath. Sin is the main enemy and the oppressor of mankind. And what has our King Jesus done? He shed His blood so that His people would be forgiven. He shed His blood so that we would never be separated from God's love. He shed His blood that he would, so that He would become the King of a forgiven people. God's kingdom of saints. Our King first had to be a priest in order to establish his kingdom with us as its citizens. Sin and death had to be addressed. Sin had to be punished. Death had to be vanquished. He became sin who no, knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The voice of the accuser has no power over you, beloved. Why? The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. Israel was saved in the Exodus, not because of how strongly they trusted God's promises, but by the blood of the Lamb. The church has been saved in the greater Exodus, not by the strength of our faith in God's promises, but by the blood of the Lamb. Spurgeon had it right. I have it on my wall. You will not be saved by feeling that Christ died for you, but by His dying for you. <laughs> 
on your own, you could do nothing to silence the accusation of Satan against you. The God-man, Jesus Christ, has silenced the accusations of the enemy once and for all through the shedding of his blood. The blood has bound the enemy and brought the new creation. The blood speaks a better word. It is finished. It is accomplished. The lion who is the lamb has conquered by his blood and won a people for himself, won a kingdom for his God. It is because of this truth that we can confidently sing. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood from my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. The blood of the promised son silences the accuser and disarms him because sin has been judged in Christ. But verse 11 continues. They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. They've conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now, I don't think that John means you, you conquer the dragon by telling your testimony as much as he means that you, saint, you conquer the dragon by testifying to the Christ who has saved you through the gospel. It is the testimony of the gospel that conquers Satan because it is in the gospel that repentance and faith are proclaimed and it is in the gospel that repentance and faith are won by the blood of the Lamb. So why do Christians rejoice as we think about the incarnation and birth of the Son of God? For blood to be shed, a promised Son must be born. The gospel testifies to the blood of the Lamb that alone saves sinners, disarms the accusers, and reconciles people to God. Paul puts it this way, Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What grace our God gives in Jesus. In the midst of great joy, however, there's a strong warning to the earth in verse 12. The dragon has been thrown out of heaven. And he has no audience with God because the blood of the lamb has defanged the serpent and his accusations. But the dragon is now on earth. And he's not happy. In fact, he's quite angry. So prepare yourself for great troubles. And I want to note at the, at the end of verse 11, the kind of salvation and protection that God provides His people from the angry serpent. The kind of salvation that God's people enjoy in this present life, we've talked about it clearly being a salvation from the penalty of sin and God's wrath. The kind of salvation that God's people enjoy in this present life isn't a salvation from hardship or the wrath of the dragon or physical death. The saints, John writes in verse 11, have conquered the, the dragon in Christ for they love not their lives even unto death. John cannot mean that God has saved his saints from physical death in this present world because these saints love not their lives even unto death. The salvation that Christ brings you isn't your best life now. It is your best life then. 
in the new creation. You presently enjoy salvation from sin's penalty and God's wrath. You've been reconciled to God. You've, you've been saved from spiritual death. You've been saved from slavery to sin. Saved from the domination of your flesh. Saved from the power of the accuser, Satan. But unless Jesus returns quite soon, all of you will physically die. The salvation that John speaks of, the safety that God provides, the nourishment he gives us in the wilderness is not primarily physical safety or freedom from the dangers of this fallen world. So how exactly, then, does God protect us now? Okay, if, if I can lose my life, that doesn't seem like a whole lot of safety. But it depends on how I'm talking about safety. How do I define safety? Well, let's define it. This brings us to the third point. The Savior secures us. Verses 13 to 17. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So I'm inclined, based on context, particularly verse 17, that to argue that God keeps us safe even in the midst of death by causing us to hold fast to the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words... God keeps us safe in this wilderness by keeping us in the faith. Keeping us from falling away. Keeping us persevering to the end so that we might inherit Christ's new creation kingdom. And then enjoy the resurrection of the dead when he returns. So Christians have no fear of death because death has lost its sting. D.A. Carson writes this, You cannot defeat an opponent who is not only willing to die, but for whom death means winning. Christians have no fear of death because death is no longer our sentence, but rather our ticket to paradise with our God. Satan can kill our bodies, but he can't condemn us to hell. God has not promised you that he will protect you from COVID, persecution, or suffering. But he has promised you, saints, that he will hold you fast all the way to the end. How? King Jesus is on the throne. And you're covered by the blood of the Lamb. So do you see why the dragon is so furious at you? <laughs> Christ's work for you and Christ's work in you makes him lose however he attacks. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's like, hey, it's great if I, if I live. It's even better if I die. How do you fight a guy like that? <laughs> if Satan doesn't kill you, you stay alive and you testify to the grace of God and Christ so that others hear the, and believe the gospel and are saved. If Satan kills you, you are immediately ushered into the presence of King Jesus where sin, pain, suffering no longer exist. Either way, the dragon has lost the war against God's people. King Jesus has secured the kingdom, given it to his people. King Jesus lives and reigns, but we're still at war. Verse 14. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. This imagery points us back to the new covenant promises of God through the prophets and the psalmists. Isaiah 40, 31 they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Okay, that clearly cannot mean physical walking, physical running, because I get very exhausted running 10 to 15 yards. Okay? What does that mean? Endurance to the end. Endurance in the faith. Endurance to the new creation. Psalm 91, 
For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Okay, that clearly cannot mean that Christians never are the victims of crime or abuse or hardship or persecution or rape or murder or any other thing. Because those things happen. So how we read this text, what does it mean? There is something far more terrible than those things that God is protecting us from. Namely, His eternal wrath forever. These are new covenant, new creation promises for God that He will protect His people. And if we assume that that protection is primarily for this life, we have, we have shown our cards as to where we believe our true home is. God will keep you securely to the end by the power of the Spirit. God will accomplish your redemption on the last day. God will hold you fast by the blood of His, of His Son, King Jesus. Satan may kill the body, but Christ will raise it on the last day. Good news for weary saints. God will hold us fast. The birth of the son, however, doesn't keep the dragon from chasing the woman. God's people, her offspring, more of God's people, seeking to do them harm. But John reveals to us in verses 14 to 16 that King Jesus will save us, and as king, he has means at his disposal to keep us in the faith, even to keep us from sin by His sovereign power over creation. I don't know, if, if I've noticed that there have been, there have been op many opportunities in my life where I, I have wanted and pursued sin, and God has kept me from it, and not given me the opportunity. I think that this is part of what He's doing here. The earth opening up, swallowing the attacks of the enemy. So again, it's not that we're, how great we are in escaping. It's that the Lord Jesus is like, you, you can't thwart as, as, as silly as you are. I love you so much, you can't thwart my purposes in keeping you and protecting you. Amen. Amen, yes. Praise the Lord, It's my running is not up to me. I'd be like, oh, take me, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. But God keeps us to the end. Jesus will hold us fast. But he will hold us fast through means. One of these biggest means. Since we're at war, we need to live together as wartime people. Live together as wartime people. None of this, none of this running off on our own. Like, hey, I'm, I'm good. I'm loving Jesus over here in the corner. Or I'm loving Jesus from the comforts of my home. Never gathering with the saints. Like those are the animals in National Geographic that always get caught and eaten. Not the ones that are in the pack. The predators are too afraid of the pack. There's strength in the pack. Part of God's means of saving grace is the church, the local church, living at war with our flesh and the devices of Satan together. We need to count all things in this world as rubbish because we will inherit Christ. That is really hard, honestly. That is very, very difficult. It is very, very difficult to consider my PlayStation 5 rubbish, honestly. It is very difficult to consider streaming and entertainment rubbish, but it is. That's a part of the dangers of this wilderness. We need to not grow weary or be distracted by the cares and concerns or deceptive practices of this world and the enemy behind it all. God will keep us firmly to the end. He will sovereignly act in this creation in order to keep us firmly to the end. But we must, verse 17, hold to the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God. John tells us in Revelation 12, 17 that the dragon went off to make war with God's people, which includes the church today. So there is a guaranteed fight. Yes. 
Here's another one of God's promises. The dragons are going to war with you. And the church endures various levels of persecution all over the world. Governments, other religions, pagan folks, unbelieving cultures all over the world resist the message of Christ and Him crucified and persecute God's people. The serpent makes war against the people of God. The lack of fight, the lack of warring in your life against the enemy might simply reflect the reality that Satan doesn't consider you an enemy, but as a slave. Repent and believe in the gospel of Christ and be saved. It is better to have Satan as an enemy than as God than God is your enemy. Turn to Christ by faith, and the blood of the Lamb will cover you and provide for you the full forgiveness of sins. Saints, in this life, you will have trouble. That's promised. You will have war. That's promised. The enemy wages war against God's elect. It is unavoidable, but it is not forever. The promised Son, Jesus Christ, has secured the victory, secured your salvation, secured the throne. Even now, He rules at God's right hand as King of kings and Lord of lords. Keep God's commands Strive to attain the prize. Fight for the obedience of faith. Hold fast to the gospel of Christ. Proclaim it regularly and without fear because King Jesus reigns. Satan has been cast down. His accusations have no power against you, beloved. May God cause us to stand firmly upon the gospel all the way to the end, because the Lamb has conquered the serpent.